Ile. Ciao, grazie. Io sto cercando di andare in questo coso. Grazie, bocco, bocco. Ok. Eh, ma ci sono andata. Help, schiaccia, help. Aiuto. È lui che ti dovrebbe invitare. Eh, mi ha invitato, ma io ho il coso. Il coso? Mm. Aiuto. Mi ha dato il link. Mm. No, tu non vai via, per, per favore, tu aiuta, Gaga. Ma no, non so come si faccia. Dove è questo qua? Ecco. Guarda che la professoressa ha scritto un sacco di roba, quella Guarda. di arte. No, poi, poi guarda, intanto ti stai usando tu. Ma io voglio aiuto, io non riesco. Non so come si fa, no, no, no. Il bacino di tu. Il bacino di Un bacino uno, un bacino all'altro. Molto.
finire a vedere che ci sono riuscita. Come si fa a metterlo grande qua? Io ho 30 partecipanti. Mm. 
Good afternoon to everybody. Hey. Good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Just sorry. Just to verify, every now and then I forget my microphone closed, and I'm just taking note of who's here. Sorry. Sorry. I ask you because you have your. You often write your. You're only your first name, and so I have some difficulty in 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 uh, finding out who is who. Uh, uh, just one one news: we have a new foreign student. We have Florian Pesce from France, but I don't know what his university is. He's somewhere in France, but I don't know where. He wants to tell us. I'm I'm from Tours. Tour, tour, tour is uh, it's in uh, Loire Valley. Yes, very important. And uh, I remind it to everybody uh, the great French writer Balzac was from Tours. So, yes, so just, right. just, to, just to keep in mind that, I mean, France, just like Italy, wherever you go, there's a, there's a, whatever town you go, you always find. Uh, you find important references to history, to literature, to art. Now, let's move to um, hoping you have uh, uh, somehow solved the problems of, I'm sorry, Tisha wasn't uh, here in our class yesterday because we discussed amply the issue of Islamic veil, which is a very hot issue in France. But I hope the class has somehow solved the issues and found the solution around the problem of uh, Islamic veil. As a matter of fact, it's rather ironic that uh, in these days, uh, everybody is not going about with a veil, but with a mask, and which is uh, uh, somehow ironic. If one did do, does this in carnival, there's nothing strange, but if you do it during, all, during the year, uh, it is somehow, uh, somehow um, uh, different. Now let's move on to, let's see, sorry, this is, stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Um, yes, okay, just let me move on to, um, yeah, okay. We were talking about yesterday, we were talking about centralism and federalism, showing how there's always been this after the fall of the Roman Empire, which obviously was centralized. Um, we have in Europe uh, since the end uh, uh, of, since the Middle Ages, uh, since the high Middle Ages, that is um, well in the eighth and ninth century, um, we have this very strong fragmentation of powers and uh, uh, therefore the idea that there's a very strong local autonomy and therefore there's not there's not really a national state but there are many uh, local autonomies that then um, give allegiance to allegiance to um, to uh, the king in exchange uh, uh, obviously for this autonomy and they pay taxes and provide uh, men for the army uh, now, what I tried to point out to you yesterday is that in the same moment, uh, more or less in the same moment, uh, when the French Revolution and the um, American Revolution are more or less in the same period, we have these two opposite tendencies. In France, towards uh, concentration of uh, power, and that is centralism, and in the US instead, the idea that there is uh, instead there should be a federalism and therefore very strong local uh, autonomy. Now, just uh, uh, here we have Paris who has joined us. Now, let's look at this uh, uh, model of centralism, um, which is France. Uh, as I've mentioned, the French Revolution is against uh, feudalism, against local autonomy. And therefore, this tendency is very, gets very strong and is formalized under Napoleon and it goes on in France until practically 1980. In 1980, and our French students surely will study this 
or has already studied this uh, La Loi de Fer, uh, uh, which somehow grants in 1980 grants some local autonomy, but uh, all the most important powers in uh, France are all concentrated in the capital. Uh, legislative, that is the uh, Senate and the uh, National Assembly, the executive, obviously the president and um, uh, the government, the judiciary, and it's all concentrated in Paris. And there's a very, very limited uh, local autonomy, mostly within the towns and municipal council that are allowed to somehow administrate their communal territory. Uh, so this is the maximum of autonomy, of local autonomy that we find in France from the Napoleonic era, that is, that is from the uh, sort of end, really, at the beginning of the 19th century to the uh, uh, end of the 20th century. And all the 90 departments in which France has is subdivided. As I remembered yesterday, the whole idea was getting rid of this very strong history of autonomy, even changing the names. So the great names, Angoulême, Bourgogne, and names like that are all eliminated. The historical names of of, uh, of, uh, of French uh, regions are eliminated and all these departments take the names of rivers or mountains. Um, so it is, uh, uh, so it just to, to eliminate even in the, in the name of the place, the, uh, the memory of past autonomies. And all these 90 departments are controlled, are under the control of a prefect, which is the representative of national government in the department. And the prefect is designated by the government and has a very, very important role in the governance of that territory. And include, this includes also control over, um, over the police. So this means that uh, it is, this gives you an idea of how strong uh, this centralization is. Now, this centralization has a very strong uh, ideology behind it, which is not, if you look at it, it's not in itself wrong, because it says we are one nation, therefore there is only one law and there's only one citizenship. So it means equal rights and equal duties for all French citizens. And so the end of the feudal system by which in each uh, part of France, everybody had different kinds of uh, rights, uh, duties, and there was a different legal system. So the idea is that of uniforming uh, in, on, on the principle of equality of all citizens, uh, the whole territory of France. So it is not, if you think of it, it is not something that is, uh, simply the idea that there must be a strong power. It's also the idea of equal standing of all French citizens in front of the law. And this model, uh, take in mind, this French model, which was uh, um, introduced in France through Napoleon, and then was replicated in many other countries, also in Italy, uh, substantially until, until the uh, constitution of 1940. And in other European countries, so it's not it's not something uh, bizarre in uh, in France. It's something that is has very strong uh, political and also legal and uh, legal reasons behind. Now, if we move from France to the uh, opposite model, that of the uh, of federalism, now let's look at the um, the First uh, element. First element is that of uh, Switzerland. It's interesting to uh, notice that um, Switzerland starts already in the Middle Ages, starts uh, creating um, uh, alliances between various Swiss cantons already in the 13th century with a defensive purpose. It is mostly meant to defend 
um, these cantons, the partitions of uh, Switzerland against foreign aggressions, foreign means mostly the Habsburgs, the, what will is the Habsburg, uh, the Austrian Empire, and also to have a, a common foreign policy. So you see it is mostly a military and a foreign policy alliance, which slowly, very slowly, especially after the 16th century, after the Protestant reform, um, puts together other cantons and gradually enlarges the scope of this confederation. Uh, please, um, just to remember this, if you look at the number plate, if you, if you remember cars that come from Switzerland, and they have on, they have that indication CH. CH is Confederation Helvetique or Confederazione Helvetica. That means that they are in that denomination. It's not Switzerland, but it is CH. So in their name, in that brand, Switzerland has the idea of a confederation. Now, what is important also? Why does this, why is this uh, model of confederation easier in Switzerland than in other parts of Europe? Because Switzerland, together with Venice, is the only republic uh, in substantial. There are other examples, but they are mostly the two main examples are Switzerland and Venice. Venice was had a huge, um, uh, was a very important in from the Middle Ages onwards till uh, its uh, dissolution this, this in 1796. Uh, it is the only their republics, and therefore there are no dynastical issues. This makes it much easier to have continuity in policy and to have uh, this idea that uh, uh, various cantons can be allied, one allies one with the other. And after the um, Napoleon, who has uh, invaded most of Europe and tries to invade, invade successfully, part of Switzerland, mostly the French cantons, the French-speaking cantons, Geneva, and but after the fall of Napoleon, there is a progressive move towards unification in the field of economy, of taxation, and of monetary affairs. It's very important to notice that in 1850, the Swiss franc is created. Now, the Swiss franc is one of those currencies which is very strong, and even in these moments, of uh, economic crisis, people tend to buy Swiss francs because they feel that that is somehow um, a currency which is a refuge. So this shows us how in uh, in uh, the uh, in Switzerland the, how gradual this move towards federalism is. And if we look at the 1999 constitution, they were constitutions before that, but the current text is that of the um, of the 1999 constitution, which is a pretty long constitution of about 200 articles, we see that there's a very clear distinction between what is the competence of the federal uh, parliament uh, and federal assembly uh, and, uh, and what instead are the cantonal competences. They keep in mind the fact that in many of these Cantons, especially the small cantons, uh, voting is direct, is sort of direct democracy, and therefore citizens vote directly on the main issues. And remember also the uh, fact that I already mentioned in the first lessons the idea that in, in the idea, the principle that in Switzerland, when you want to change the constitution, it must be submitted to a referendum. And every year there are many referenda that help to change the constitution, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. So this is just to remind you that, I mean, we have this example of federalism way back in the history, in the center of, of, of Switzerland, of uh, Europe. Now let's move instead to the uh, biggest uh, federation or confederation, which is that of the, um, US, United States of America. 
United States, if you think of it, it means we just say US, USA. Uh, we don't generally focus on this, the first two uh, terms, United States, and the notion that there are states that are united, which gives us an idea of, uh, of uh, um, the, the days a federation of these states. Now, uh, I just want to again bring you back to some fundamental pages in the uh, creation of the uh, US because they're very important. They were important at that time. They are still important today because they are constantly referred to by the US Supreme Court and by uh, US uh, courts, but also they are very useful for us Europeans to understand today what we mean by uh, federation. What is a federation? So the main point uh, is these Federalist Papers, uh, which are the um, also by uh, three of the founding fathers of the U.S. and of the U.S. Constitution, and the ones that we remember mostly are Hamilton and Madison. Madison will be eventually uh, president of the U.S. We've met him in Marbury versus Madison. In, there, in that case, he was the Secretary of State. Then when Jefferson steps down, ends his, his term as president, Madison takes his uh, his seat and becomes president of the US. So this is the uh, Federalist Papers, which is a very interesting from a political theory point of view. It's very important also for today when we start discussing about federation and federalism. Now, what I'll just have a couple of slides here on this Federalist Paper number 39, um, that, which is dated 1788, in which uh, Hamilton and Madison... Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, there is a lot of echo uh, when you're speaking, and I think I'm not alone uh, with this problem. Okay, one second. Let me see what, what I can do. One second. Just okay. let, me, um, let me see what, uh, how to solve the echo issue. Um, Uh, can you hear me now? Is it is it sufficiently? Is there still the echo? No, it's. I think it's better. I don't know. But it's some time actually. Uh, just tell me if. Well, let's go one second. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, uh, it, it, I think it's better. Okay. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, now I'll just um, give you a couple of slides of the uh, with excerpts from the uh, from the Federalist Paper number thirty nine, and just to uh, this, which is of seventeen eighty eight. So it is a commentary to the U.S. Constitution, which remember is of seventeen eighty seven. So it's a year before. Now, what are Hamilton and Madison doing? They're trying to explain oh, what is the um, sort of the centralism and federalism in the US Constitution. And so uh, the difference is between a federal government and a national, national means a central government, uh, it relates to the operation of government. And in the former, that is the federal government, the powers operate on the political bodies composing the Confederacy. So this set shows that it has to do with the political bodies, which are the states. While in the 
in the uh, uh, national government, that is a central government, uh, the operation of government is on the individual citizens composing the nation in their individual capacities. So you see immediately how Hamilton and, and Madison point out that there are two elements. We have local, uh, local uh, distributed sovereignty, the states of the US, and that makes it a federal, um, a federal uh, government. But at the same time, there's an issue of uh, um, uh, a nation, of a single nation, and that is in the citizenship of the US, all the US citizens. So these two elements, we have citizens and we have states, and how these two uh, uh, elements are somehow uh, balanced. And in the further uh, point, uh, the we have to look at the extent of the powers of government. The main issue, remember, the main one of the reasons behind the, 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 US, uh, the US revolution and was the idea of uh, limiting um, absolute power and having the power distributed. So the idea that the separation of powers between the legislative and the executive and the judiciary that somehow is balancing between the two. So the uh, issue here is what is the extent of the powers in a, in a federalist state and in a centralist state? So among a people consolidating one nation, a centralist state, this supremacy is completely vested in the national legislature. So, and this is the idea that parliament is the Sovereignty, yes, he uh, speaks of supremacy, but sovereignty is in uh, vested upon uh, parliament. While among communities united for particular purposes, as in the case of the United States, it is vested partly in the general and partly in the municipal um, uh, legislatures. So just to show this dual role of centralism and federalism. And in the latter, that is the, um, the federalist model, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy, no more subject within their respective spheres to the general authority. So it shows how, what does, in a federalist state, what does it mean when you start speaking of the autonomy of the states of the United States. What is the autonomy of Virginia, of Massachusetts, or of Georgia or New York? Just to point out that how the, this very uh, precise analysis of the provisions of the US Constitution. And uh, in relation uh, to this, the proposed government, obviously, of which comes out from the US Constitution, cannot be deemed a national one, that is a centralized one, because it leads to the several states of residuary and unviable sovereignty over all other subjects. So it says this is the, our constitution, the US constitution is not a centralized, it does not create a centralized state. It is a state in which the, uh, the single states, members of the of confederation have a uh, residual and inviolable sovereignty over all other subjects. And uh, the point is, who is going to decide when there is the invasion of field with the national government is within its competences and does not invade the competences of the, of the single states and vice versa. And it says that tribunal, the courts, and this is the, the point of Article 3 of the US Constitution, which we will analyze when we're looking at judicial power, is clearly essential to prevent an appeal to the sword and a dissolution to the compact. Now, this is somehow a prophecy, uh, which we shall see that unfortunately is not, uh, um, not followed, we shall see, because what Hamilton and Madison are saying 
that the balance between uh, the federal government and the single states is somehow must be somehow balanced by the, uh, the judiciary. Because, sorry, someone has the microphone on. Sorry, can you please close your microphone? That's okay. Someone has their microphone on. We're gonna die. It's terrible, but like, inevitable. Why it sounds like. Sorry. Okay. Now let's go back. Sorry, just let me. Go back to the slides. So the Hamilton and, uh, and Madison point out that the judiciary, in particular the Supreme Court, should somehow find its way and balance the, the um, what are the competencies of the federal government with those of the single states. And and here we finish this last slide on the Federalist paper. Uh, um, if we try the Constitution to the authority by which amendments are to be made, that is how to amend the Constitution, we find it neither wholly national, that is centralist, nor wholly federal, that is federalist. Because uh, as we have seen, in order to modify the Constitution, let me see if there are. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, if we look at how to modify the, con the U.S. Constitution, it is not only necessary that Congress, in its various representation, um, uh, and remember, the House of Representatives is the national. Uh, representative in the sense that it represents the, all the citizens of the US while the Senate represents the, uh, the states, that it is necessary that the uh, change of the Constitution, amendments of the Constitutions are voted not only by Congress but also by the single states by a certain very strong majority of the single states. So just to point out that it is uh, uh, computing the proportion by states, not by citizens, departs from the national and advances towards the federal character. So just to show how already in 1788 there was very clear the, the issue of the relationship between uh, and the tension between a centralized government, a federal government, and the local autonomy which is vested upon the single states that form the United States. Now, how do we translate this? Now, let's look at the, uh, how this um, uh, comes out. That this contrast between the Federalists, what we call the Confederates, who support strong autonomy of the states, especially Southern states, and the Unionists, who support the centralization of power in Congress, and the president are in the origin of the U.S. Civil War, um, which is from 1861 to uh, 1865, bloody war, 700,000 uh, Americans killed in it. And I will come to you with a very short video, which gives you an actual, give you an idea of the role that the Supreme Court had in somehow uh, not provoking, but had a significant role in bringing this U.S. Civil War. Now, what is the, uh, let's just skip over, uh, over the U.S. Civil War and let's try and see how today the, the, the balance between a, a centralized uh, trend and uh, um, uh, federation, federative, uh, that is state power, the single states is somehow set out. Remember that when we looked at the US Constitution, we had Article 1, Paragraph 7, which set out the 
powers of Congress. It is a list of what the Congress can decide, what are its powers, its competencies. And remember the 10th Amendment of the, uh, to the Constitution says that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So the idea is that the only enumerated powers of Congress are only enumerated powers. Things are not so easy because certain clauses in, in, in Section 7 of Article 1 are pretty well uh, flexible and have been interpreted in a rather flexible way. But just to point out that this is the idea that, um, that the US has still has over um, after the end of the Civil War. And that the balance between the, uh, the unifying trend, which is the uh, federation that keep, should keep everybody together, and instead the federalist structure or autonomy of the single states is in this, these two chambers. The House of Representatives represents the whole of the US, while the Senate represents the single states on an equal basis. Remember, two senators for each, um, uh, for each state, whether it's, uh, it's New York, California, it's two members and it's uh, North Dakota or Nebraska, it's two uh, senators. It's the same on an equal standing. So just to point out that it is, uh, uh, this is how um, it is, uh, um, you know, the system in the US somehow is um, now. Uh, sorry, just let me go back to, now I want to bring you, um, I want to bring you to uh, uh, show you a very short video, which I will, I will launch it. Just let me go on the, hopefully it works. Dred Scott was born as a slave in Virginia in the 1790s. He was sold to John Emerson, a doctor in the U.S. Army. He allowed Dred Scott to marry, and they had two daughters. Emerson eventually died, and Scott sued the widow for his freedom. He claimed that he should be set free because he was illegally held when his master took him to Illinois and Wisconsin, both free territories. The case eventually made it up to the Supreme Court as Dred Scott versus Sanford. Sanford was the brother of Emerson's widow. The case was decided on March 6, 1857, just two days after Buchanan's inauguration. The court held that it did not have jurisdiction over the case because Dred Scott was not a citizen of the United States. Since the Constitution only gives the federal government the authority between citizens of different states, Scott needed to be a citizen to have a valid case. It becomes necessary, therefore, to determine who were citizens of the several states when the Constitution was adopted. The legislation and histories of the times and the language used in the Declaration of Independence show that neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves, nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as a part of the people, nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument. They pointed to colonial laws in the text of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. The court said that someone cannot lose their property of slaves just because they went to a state or territory where slavery was illegal. It declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional because it would deprive property as well. This was only the second time in American history that the Supreme Court said an act of Congress was unconstitutional. 
Seven justices agreed with the decision and two did not. The dissenting justices said that blacks could become citizens because at the time of the founding, they could vote in 10 out of the 13 states, which would overturn much of the argument. This case did not settle the issue of slavery once and for all as the South hoped. Instead, the decision was considered very offensive in the North and strengthened the abolitionist movement and the new Republican Party. Dred Scott's and his family's freedom was purchased, but he died less than two years after being freed. Okay, now, uh, just to point out, in this, in this short video you saw, uh, you saw um, it, the mention was that the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional the so-called Missouri Compromise, which was an agreement uh, which Congress voted uh, um, somehow limiting, uh, limiting slavery in the U.S. states. And uh, this is seen as an invasion of competences of, uh, by the, uh, by the um, Federal Congress on the competences of the uh, single states. And then from this decision of 1857, you see there are only four years that bring go uh, then to the, uh, to the uh, uh, US uh, Civil War. So contrary to what Hamilton and uh, Madison um, sort of felt, the idea that the courts, the Supreme Court, could avoid a conflict between the federalist uh, notion and, uh, and uh, uh, the idea that each state is independent and instead the idea of a, a national uh, Congress, uh, instead it is exactly a decision by the Supreme Court that somehow sparks uh, the uh, US civil, uh, civil, uh, civil war. A third element, which is interesting, I'd just like to point out to you, you see that uh, um, the, it was mentioned in the, in the short video, it was mentioned that there is uh, uh, the Republicans. At that time, the Republicans, which are newly born, are the sort of the advanced, uh, uh, the anti-slavery party. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, who you all know, is the US president that somehow um, um, declared war on the Confederate states in the Southern states when they did not, they refused to abolish slavery, uh, was a Republican. And so uh, while at that time, Democrats were instead mostly, not all of them, mostly favoring slavery, just to show how uh, the the brands, the labels can change, can remain the same during the centuries, and, but the content behind them can be significantly, uh, significantly different. Now, this is what, um, just to point out again, finally, that the, the idea that uh, we find behind uh, these uh, uh, issues of uh, centralism and of federalism, we find also decisions by the courts. And I will return to this aspect at the end of the, at the, end of the lesson. Now, just to uh, go back to our uh, slides. Um, now, as I've mentioned, in Europe, uh, we have mostly following the, uh, except from Switzerland, following the French model, which became the model around uh, most of Europe, as a matter of fact, it already existed in Prussia. But Prussia was a relatively small country from its size. Uh, <coughs> this French model becomes a dominant model in, uh, in Europe, not only in, uh, in continental Europe, but also in Great Britain, the idea of centralization, everything centralized. Now, what is interesting is seeing how the, after the Second World War, we find moves towards uh, some forms of uh, federalism or anyhow increasing local autonomy, not really federalism, but increasing local autonomy. Uh, just to give you a few examples, uh, remember that the, the, the American system 
Congress has two chambers, Senate and House of Representatives. The House of Representatives represents the citizens. The, um, the, the Senate represents the states and the senators are elected each, two for each state. Now, in France, what we find that the Senate is um, elected by local assemblies. That is, the local assemblies uh, elect their representatives in the Senate, which therefore the Senate is, has a competence mostly, not exclusively, but mostly on uh, local issues. In uh, Germany, Germany, which has in its name Federal Republic of Germany, it is Federal Republic of Germany because after the Second World War, when Germany was defeated and occupied by uh, at least the Western part, by the uh, Allied troops, by uh, American, British, and French troops, the Americans, who were obviously the strong uh, power who had managed to defeat Germany, imposed on Germany its new constitution, the idea that they should give federal uh, a federal state. And therefore, we see that the, in the uh, German constitution, we find that there is a national government, a federal government, but then there are the regions, what are which in German are called lenders, uh, which are, uh, have strong uh, local powers. Now, what does this mean from uh, uh, the Congress part, of, from Parliament, parliamentary point? is that in, uh, in uh, Germany we find an, what is a House of Representatives, the Bundestag, which ordinarily makes the laws, and then we find the Bundesrat, which is the equivalent of the Senate, which represents the 16 uh, uh, regions. It's interesting because uh, each region elects the members uh, that have to go to the Bundesrat, but uh, if one Whoever gets elected must follow what are the decisions of the of the majority of that uh, um, of that region. So even if I'm a socialist representative uh, in this, uh, being elected by socialist voters, and I go to represent uh, my region in the German Senate. If my, in my region the majority is Christian Democrat or social uh, Christian, Christian social, then I will have to follow that tendency and I can't follow the socialist tendency, my, my political party. Just to show these various um, uh, uh, sort of forms through which uh, parliament somehow has to, has to um, uh, compensate and find a balance between uh, centralized uh, tendency and uh, um, federal, uh, more uh, decentralized and local autonomy tendency. Now, just to keep in mind that we find many uh, terms, federalism, federation, we find in England, we find devolution, we find many terms for some things that are similar but they are all expressions um, that somehow show uh, a tendency in all modern states towards decentralization. Why is this? Because first of all, the state has increases its competences. Just think of health. We have this health crisis. Obviously, uh, you cannot govern a hospital which is uh, distant uh, hundreds of kilometers from the capital uh, you need to have local authorities that somehow uh, control that hospital, that, uh, the, that health system uh, at, the local, at the local level. So, uh, or think also educational schools and, and other uh, educational institutions. So, this is uh, the great increase in competences um, means that the central state cannot hold all these competences. The second is a notion of what is called democratic proximity. That is that the institutions that govern should be geographically near their respective territory. And so it is the idea that uh, there should be some direct relationship uh, between uh, the government and direct in the sense of physical, a local uh, relationship between those who govern and those who are governed. 
So this is just to show how this uh, this issue is very much uh, on the move in the last in Europe in continental Europe. Even a country like France has moved towards uh, decentralization, and a country historically that was somehow unified, uh, very strongly unified, then gradually like the. Uh, Great Britain has progressively given autonomy to Scotland, to Northern Ireland, to Wales, just to show that this is a tendency that we we can see this in in the whole part of of, of Europe. Obviously, as you've seen in Italy, as our Italian students know, we have our twenty regions, and uh, and there are but all of them, some with a special regime and, uh, and special powers, and some with an order regime but with very extended powers indicated in Article 117 of the Italian Constitution. Now, let's try and look at uh, uh, what are, uh, how, to what extent do we have a decentralized government? So when we compare various forms of uh, uh, local autonomy of decentralized government uh, well we look at we have a whole lot of markers and uh, we a checklist we start looking at this checklist and uh, uh, we start saying what are the areas of competence of central and of local institutions so is uh, uh, remember the u.s constitution section seven of Article one. It lists uh, the competences of the of the uh, of Congress. So, are the which are the competences of uh, central government, and what are the competences of local institutions? So, this is the first point, which is very important. What is included in the list, and what is not included in the list? So, this is the first one. The second element that we must look at. If there are, if any, shared competences uh, between central and local level. So there are some um, uh, um, topics, some issues which have to be decided together. They are not decided only by the national instance, they are not decided only by the local instance, but must be decided together. Now, this is also a very complex. Uh, problem because sometimes we do not find uh, that one does not find an agreement between these two uh, these two instances, the central instance and the local instance. So this is the uh, the, the the point uh, uh, of shared competence. So not only local and national, but also shared competence. Then we have the further element is. Uh, what is the status of local lawmaking institutions? So clearly we have, uh, it is from a legal point of view, we have very clearly the notion of what is a decision taken by a municipal town council. A town council introduces, uh, well, a new uh, tariff for parking or establishes uh, um, uh, urban, uh, an urban planning plan uh, which establishes what are the parts of the town that can be built and what, how they can be built and what are the, the green zones of a town, for example. Just think of the many very important decisions that a town council takes and the uh, decisions that could be taken at a higher level uh, let's imagine a regional level. What are they from in the hierarchy of the legal sources? What is their position? Are they at the same level of, uh, of, the, uh, of a national law, of a law by parliament, or are they at a different level? So what we are interested uh, is trying to understand uh, how the lawmaking procedure works in uh, local autonomies, whether we call them, um, uh, whether we call them um, uh, regions, uh, lender, or um, 
parts uh, like of the, of the national state, like we find in Scotland or Northern Ireland or Wales. Um, so what we are interested, whatever we call it, we want to look at these assemblies that decided the lawmaking assemblies, what is their position in the constitution of that country? And what is the product, the product they have, what is the level in the various sources of the, of the law? Then, very important, to what extent these local institutions may entertain foreign relations. They may have relations with other countries. So uh, this is very important. Think of, uh, we have there are many regions. Take, for example, in France, uh, two very important uh, departments, Alsace and Lorraine, which are in the northeast of France and which are border with, uh, with Germany. And they have, and part of the, so the, the population speaks uh, some kind of German dialect. Uh, so can they have a relationship with, with, uh, uh, with the Federal Republic of Germany, these two departments? Or must they, is it the only authority that can have relationship with Germany is France, nation of France? And the same thing, just think of Italy, the province of Bolzano, which is a mostly German-speaking uh, uh, province in South Tyrol, and can this province have, and which has a special legal regime, can you have foreign relations with Austria, which is the bordering country? Uh, just to point out, this is a very delicate issue because it has to do with international law, and therefore recognition from uh, an international law perspective of local autonomies. Are these local autonomies uh, part of the state and therefore only the state can speak for them or may they have relations with foreign entities? Remember the US constitution says that the relations are held of for all the states, foreign relations are in the hands of the president. So just keep in mind this, that also in an extremely in federalist state, the, the president holds foreign relations. It isn't that the, the, the sort of the governor of, uh, of California or Texas, they can uh, have relations, foreign relations, in doing treaties with Mexico or with, uh, uh, who knows, with Japan or China. It is the US that has, uh, the president that has competence for foreign relations. But this gives us an idea. Then how, if and how local institutions participate in the formation of central institutions. We've seen these two cases of the, uh, of the um, or rather the case of the uh, French Senate where it is the local assembly that designates the members of the, of, the, of the French Senate. And this was the idea behind the aborted uh, reform of the Italian constitution. Um, uh, two years ago, we had, three years ago, we had a referendum in Italy, which was meant to change the constitution and to introduce a two chamber parliamentary system in which the Senate substantially was a Senate of the regions. And therefore the members of the, uh, of the Senate were uh, designated by the regions. This constitutional reform did not pass. It was uh, put down in, uh, in a national referendum and therefore did not become part of the constitution. And as you see, there's a tendency to say, well, uh, should local institutions, uh, local parliaments, let's call them parliaments, uh, should they elect also members of one of the two chambers of the, of the, uh, of the national parliament? So this is um, very, uh, a very important aspect. And then we have uh, this further element which is if and in what form local institutions retain not only legislative and administrative powers, which seems quite obvious, but also have their own judicial order. Now, this is a very delicate issue. 
in the US, we see that there are two levels which are allies. This, there are two levels. There's a federal judiciary and then there's a state judiciary. This means that in the uh, in the US, we have federal judges who are federal judges who are designated, remember the powers of the president with the advice and consent of the Senate, uh, who designates the who designates the um, presidents and the, 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 ju uh, the judges. And if you remember Marbury versus Madison, the midnight judge, Mr. Marbury, was designated by uh, President Adams before he left office. Um, uh, and there is in the US also a state level. There are judges at the state level, completely separate from the federal level and which are designated through particular rules. In some cases, in smaller states, they are, are elected, the judges are elected. In others, there's a process procedure of, of designation by the governor having here the local Congress uh, of the state. So just to show that there are very many forms of designating through which one designates one in the US one designates state uh, judges. Uh, now, uh, this is, we find this very rarely. We don't find uh, local judges in the sense that the, the judiciary system is decentralized in the sense that it has their local courts, but they all depend from the national system. There are no, generally speaking, in Europe, whether we are talking of uh, France, or we are talking of Germany, of Spain, of Italy, uh, or we do not find uh, that the local authorities have their own judicial order. They have, they designate their own uh, judges. So just to point out, this is a further very important aspect when we want to look and try to understand if uh, if the, what is the level of federalism uh, looking at the, using the us as the sort of the the, the, the highest level of uh, federalism and then final point extremely important point taxation and public spending powers of local institutions now this is the argument i will take this up again when we're looking at taxation in itself but the idea that you uh, those who pay the taxes, uh, these taxes should go to the community and be spent, spent for that community is a very strong idea. Naturally, if you have a national state, the idea is that, that all the taxes that are paid by all citizens go to the national state. But uh, growingly, we see that there is a tendency to say, we, at a local level establish the taxes and we at a local level spend those taxes. Now, this is something that is a very delicate issue. I just would like to remind you that one of the main reasons behind the attempt of Catalonia uh, to success from, uh, from Spain is the idea that they say, oh, but we produce enormous amount, we are rich, we produce enormous amount of taxes, and we want to spend our taxes here in Catalonia. We won't, don't want them, these taxes to go to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to Andalusia or to Canary Islands. We want, we want to spend our taxes here. And this was originally in the idea when nearly more than, uh, more than uh, 30 years ago, there was this idea of Padania, the sort of the, the northern, northern region saying, oh, but we are going to, uh, the secession idea was that as we are rich and we pay lots of taxes, we want to be uh, self-sufficient and we want to spend the money by ourselves. We want to pick, uh, choose what taxes to pay, and we want to spend the money ourselves. We do not want to give the, these, uh, the monies to other Italian regions. So just to point out, this of taxation of spending powers is a very, very delicate issue in, in throughout Europe. And uh, 
and it is uh, often brings up uh, tendencies and tends to leave uh, uh, to leave the uh, move out of and have a secession from a country. So just to point out that this is a point that we must keep in mind. Now, what I would like to uh, to analyze finally uh, today is this notion of centralism and federalism in this institution, which is uh, um, uh, which is uh, vital for our most of our all our living, what we do, what we do not do, which is the European Union. And here I will be asking our two British students, Kid and Wood, um, uh, to intervene because Brexit is something that comes into the into the into the picture and just to see the various views on this issue. Now let's look at I just want to show you this. So the point is, is the EU a federation or simply a supranational organization with extended powers? Now this is a very heated debate, but it's not only a theoretical debate, it is a very heated political debate, and it brings may be behind uh, well the Brexit movement or other attempts or proposals to leave the European Union. So the idea is if the EU is a federation, then obviously the single states have abdicated from a whole lot of sovereignty and have transferred a great part of their sovereignty to the European Union institution. Noticeably, the Commission. This is the main, as you remember the slides I gave to you on, on, the, on the structure of the European Union, sort of the idea that the, um, that the uh, Commission is the real government and is the motor of the European Union. Or is it simply a supranational organization with extended power? Let's imagine the United Nations. Well, the United Nations is not a federation. It is an international organization which has a certain amount of powers, but uh, we're limited. It isn't that the United Nations can establish what we do in Italy, taxes or other matters or uh, other issues. It has, can have some kind of competence in certain moments, typically peacekeeping moments, but otherwise it doesn't really have all that influence. So the point is, what is the view? How do we view the European Union uh, in this, um, uh, this conflict between centralism and federalism? Now, just I would like to point out a couple of uh, articles in uh, of the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, 2007 which then comes into force in 2009. Now, article, uh, two articles mostly, Article 4 and Article 5 of the Treaty of Lisbon. So, Article 4 says, competencies not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the Member States. Now, this seems substantially the Tenth Amendment to the US Constitution. Powers that are not, let's go back to it, just to remind you, Powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution are reserved to the states. So this is Tenth Amendment. So we translate this in the Lisbon Treaty, competence not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the member states. And as a matter of fact, also in Article 5, just to point out, also in Article 5, says the same thing, competence not conferred upon the Union in the treaties remain with the member states. So it says twice, it says, this principle. Now, so I said, oh, well, then we have adopted substantially the uh, sort of the American system by which states still have, they have given to the union only those limited competences and uh, uh, that's it, not more than that. So we look at the list of competences, pretty long, but we've given them only that. So there are no other competences of the union. Uh, but and Article 4 
says add something more and says, well, listen, not only competence not conferred upon the union and treaties remain with the member states, but the union respects the equality of member states. So all states are equal. So no states, first class, second class, well, when it comes to voting rights, they are actually, they are somehow different. Their national identities, their fundamental structures, political and constitutional, inclusive of regional and local self-government, that is the idea that uh, obviously if one state wants to organize itself in a federal way like Germany, well, that is it is entirely free. If we want in Italy, we want to change our system, we, becomes, uh, we can change it and it becomes uh, um, complete federation of all the 20 regions, we can do this. I mean, this is part of our, of, of our free choice. Then territorial integrity of the state, this means who decides on uh, if, for example, we decide we want to give some islands, the uninhabited islands, to, let's say, to France or to uh, to Libya, uh, well, we, this is up to us, Malta, it's up to us, territorial integrity is our business, it's not business of someone else. Maintaining law and order, safeguarding national security, and national security which remains the sole responsibility of each member state. So Article 4 seems to say, well, listen, the union has only these competences, we will not trespass on the competences of member states and uh, uh, which retain sovereignty in these various aspects, completely free to do, to act in these uh, points that are mentioned in, the, in this slide. However, when we move to Article 5, notwithstanding the point, the last point that competence is not conferred upon the union and treaties remain with the member states, it says that union competences are governed by the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. Now, and the union shall act only within the limits of the competence conferred upon it by the member states to attain the objectives set out in the treaties and then we move further in Article 5, under the principle of subsidiarities in areas which do not fall within its exclusive competence, the union shall act only if, and insofar as the objectives of the proposed action cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states, either at the central level or at regional or local level, but can rather, by reason of the scale or effects of the proposed action, be better achieved at union level. So this idea of subsidiarity, what the subsidiarity means, that in certain moments and in certain circumstances, the union can take the, uh, can uh, supersede uh, national decisions by the national, uh, national governments, by the member states, and take decisions which um, somehow are imposed to all member states. As a matter of fact, this is uh, not so automatic in the sense that it requires a uh, special decision by the council. And remember, the council represents all member states of the European Union, and it requires special majorities, both of states and of citizens, of number of citizens. Of the, um, of, the, of the European Union, uh, but however, this is a way, the principle of subsidiarity is a way to pass, to go around the idea that the competences of the Union are only those of the, uh, of the uh, which are set out. Look at this, what I just put this here in bold, in areas which do not fall within its exclusive competence. So it says, well, we can, in areas, in these areas, we can somehow, the union can substitute itself. The notion of subsidiarity means you're substituting your power to uh, some other because you feel you can exercise this power better. And, well, principle of subsidiarity has this 
uh, limit, which is that of proportionality, which we know is a very important principle in contemporary legal system. Any uh, action must be proportional. The contentum form of the union action shall not exceed what is necessary to achieve the objectives on the treaties. Who decides this? Well, we will see the role when we eventually arrive to it of the European Court of Justice. But just to show that the, um, the, the role, uh, when we ask ourselves if the European Union is um, uh, the question we, I put before, federation or simply supranational organization with extended powers, I would tend to say it is not a supranational organization with extended powers. It is much more similar to uh, a federation. And here I would like to open a little bit of debate and I hope uh, Kid and Wood intervene. So I just sort of, I'm trying to, question I'm asking is, do you think that, uh, to all the class, this is the question, do you think that um, the, the fact that the European Union has such strong powers and thanks to the principle of subsidiarity can substitute itself to member states does this mean is this one of the causes or can be one of the arguments for moving out of the european union and say we do not want to delegate any longer our sovereignty to the european union because we want to retain all our sovereignty within ourselves and we don't want to give anybody else the power to decide for us. So I think this is a very important debate because it is a lively, it's been a very heated debate in, the, in Great Britain, but it is uh, uh, obviously, uh, just let me get back here uh, to, the, um, to the, the, the debate in this, uh, in this, this period. Now, uh, Don Francisco asks, send the presentation yes surely i will be sending them uh, not this afternoon tomorrow which when i don't have lessons i'll be sending you uh, the slides so just to point out i will surely be sending you slides now can we just sort of uh, uh, I, can i can i ask kid and wood to open the discussion do you how much do you think that the principle set out in the lisbon treaty the fact that the uh, uh, the European the Union, the European Union had such extended powers, in particular the principle of subsidiarity. How much do you think has influenced, uh, apart from political rhetoric, has actually influenced the decision of to leave the European Union? I wonder if kid and Hello, Wood. can you yes, hear me? Kid. Yes, great kid. Where, where are you now? Where are you in Britain? I'm in England. Yes, I know that. Where? <laughs> Sorry, I'm in Warwick at the moment. Warwick. Have they closed the pubs in Warwick? No, the pubs are still open. <laughs> well, then, no then one's there, though. Drink, well, drink a glass for us. We can't go. We all, <laughs> and obviously, it's kids' health. So we are sort of, we're so she has to look after her health. But if she goes to a pub, we ask her to drink something to our cats. Okay, go ahead, kid. Can you, what's your opinion on this, on the role of the powers of the European Union in the Brexit decision by the, the British, British voters? I think definitely it played a big part in the decision of the UK people to leave the EU. One of the main things that people were voting for was to get our laws back and whether or not that's people misunderstood or completely understood the powers that are in the Lisbon Treaty, I don't know. But I think it definitely played an important part in the, in the decision made by the people. Hmm. Now, uh, is Wood, uh, Wood, are you online? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. can, what, what's your opinion on this? Because I, would like, I think it's important. I mean, the fact that the, that the UK from the 31st this time till the 31st of December. I mean, until the 31st of December, it's a situation in which there's negotiations going on. So for the moment, Great Britain is, well, it's out, but it's 
still partially ill but I, in. But I think we have to sort of discuss this because uh, anyhow, British citizens are European, anyhow, belong to Europe. It isn't that the, uh, Brexit is going to somehow set up a wall on the channel and that will separate Great Britain from the rest of Europe. Maybe from a legal point of view, yes, but um, from a sort of social and cultural point of view, no. So I wanted to know what's your view, Becker? Uh, I also agree with Albany on that one. And um, I think that there was a lot of misunderstanding in the UK as to whether we, in fact, didn't have our sovereignty as a result of being part of the EU. But then looking at a lot of other EU laws, looking at the European Convention on Human Rights, the Bill of Rights in that was not actually directly put into the UK's national law. The UK actually, for such things, the UK actually has to create their own acts for it to be implemented. Whereas what I understand is that in other countries in the European Union, it's automatically put as part of their laws. Whereas the UK made the Human Rights Act in order to put through um, such things. But then in terms of the EU itself, there was actually a case called Factor Tame, where it was decided that, um, uh, where the UK courts decided that EU national, EU's laws would be, would have first place to the UK national law. So they would supersede the UK's national laws. But looking at, looking at it from my perspective, I would say that the UK's judicial system has decided that. So it's still some kind of form of sovereignty. But um, it is, I think that's the only relevant argument to say that there's a lack of sovereignty in the UK as a result of being part of the EU. But at the same time, it's still up to judicial discretion. So I think there was a lot of misunderstanding of that with the public and people not exactly knowing the implications of being part of the EU and leaving it at the same time. I just written on the on the whiteboard this decision, this very important decision, factor tame case, which comes with referred from Great Britain, and somehow uh, it is one of the cases which state the primacy of uh, EU law, law over national law and therefore that EU law, once it has been uh, voted according to and enacted according to the regular procedures, it is above national law and therefore member states have to abide by uh, the, the uh, EU law. Just to, just to remind, uh, obviously um, Wood has studied EU law, our Italian students still will have to next year will be studying uh, EU law, so they surely will meet this factor 10 case, but it is uh, very, uh, very important. Now, just uh, uh, can I now see if uh, uh, some of our um, Italian students, what they, how do they feel about this issue of sovereignty and national sovereignty? Uh, do you feel as now, you haven't, as I've mentioned, you haven't yet studied EU law, but do you feel that EU um, sort of institutions invade too much what is the sovereignty of the Italian national state? I seem to understand, well, there's also patients French, but uh, do you feel that they're invading too much national, uh, national uh, sovereignty or not? Or do you think this is in the best interest of Europe to have delegated certain powers to the European Union. I'd like to open the floor to everyone to see if we can discuss this very heated issue, very hot issue in constitutional, uh, constitutional topic. Nobody? Anybody? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, the Dominican Antonio. Here we have the Dominican Antonio. Yes, loud and clear. What's your opinion? My opinion is that, first of all, I, per I can say not partially. I completely agree with also the things that, about also this misunderstanding that our, we say, colleagues, yes, our British colleagues said. I also think that this idea that we are like invaded by European. Uh, treaties, institutions, things. I think that also this idea that Italian matters, Italian subjects, all our independent is, independence is practically invaded. I think also this derives from 
uh, a complete, not only misunderstanding, but a really lack of knowledge about how the European Union works. I experienced this thing also personally, but I experienced this thing when at the last 26th of May, there were the European elections and practically on Google, one of the most searched terms is what is the European Union, how the European Union works. I think that mostly of our common ideas about how the European Union works derives not by really uh, founded opinions, but a real lack of knowledge about what we should okay. say. Okay, Domenico Antonio, is there anybody else who wants to who wants to intervene on this on this topic of uh, of um, uh, topic of uh, uh, European Union and its powers and the fact of if these powers are too extended or not? Just wondering if can I? Teria, yes, yeah, we have Teria. Uh, yes, I think uh, a little bit different uh, than the the president student because um, yes, there is uh, a lack of knowledge. But for me, the most important problem is that all the European states that uh, are part of the union are giving to the union part of the sovereignty and part of significant. Uh, um, sector of the state. Uh, the more important is the financial one, uh, one because if you don't allow to uh, make money and make a governance of, of the money on the single state, uh, you force the all the states that has the the same money and the same bank uh, to deal with this. And the problem is that is not a lack of sovereignty is lack uh, of uh, an orga uh, organization because uh, we don't have a truly European executive. The European Parliament, yeah, can do European law. We can talk about European law, but there are not probably like a national parliament. So for me, the problem is that it's like is made by half. The oh, sorry, sir. Yeah, are you saying that? Are you saying that in your view, the com the powers the powers of the executive, that is, the council and the commission of the union uh, executive, council and commission, are too weak? They should be stronger. I just sorry. trying to. Uh, I just want to know if this is your uh, Not bottom line of your of your soul. Not totally stronger, but the fact is that the European Union can have a strong executive uh, uh, power, but there are the national executive in the council that has the strongest, uh, uh, we can say, force as executive. The problem okay. is that the oh. European one and not the national one is not so strong. The European Commission is not so strong as I think it should be. Okay. This is this is Teria's point of view. Then is someone else? Does someone else want to enter the discussion or send a message on chat? Um, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, that's uh, it. Okay, uh, I'd like to say that uh, I think it's a political matter, of course, but uh, if you want to create a union to be more competitive on the market or in other uh, fields like, uh, but economic mainly. But you have to uh, delegate some functions and sovereign, sovereignty to, uh, to, for example, the European Union. So uh, yes, the problem that uh, my colleague brought up is, is fundamental, which is uh, European institutions aren't as strong as they should be. But it's, it's a real problem because, of course, we, when we are talking about sovereignty, uh, no uh, nationals, no nationals uh, govern, governments want to uh, delegate more sovereignty and um, well yes uh, they have to be stronger but i don't think it's possible sorry just just let me uh, break in here we have uh, i see sorry i've seen only now that we have uh, um we have first of all we have uh sylvie Xiu from from are you in hong kong sylvie yeah i'm in hong kong now well, so that, just I'm telling to the class, we have students that are in England, uh, Hamilton, 
We also have Christy Hamilton. Where are you? Are you in Edinburgh or are you in Northern Ireland? Hamilton, where are you? Hamilton doesn't answer. Now, sorry, uh, Hugh, can you, uh, as we, I, I hope you managed to follow the lesson, and we were talking about centralism and autonomy. Now, Hong Kong is a very interesting case because since it was a return to the motherland, the China motherland, it has always um, somehow tried to keep a certain amount of autonomy and recently there has been uh, quite a considerable amount of uh, disruptions in Hong Kong which have been widely publicized in order to maintain this autonomy. Now, what is your view from Hong Kong on the notion of autonomy? Can, to what extent can Hong Kong be actually autonomous from uh, China, from the People's Republic of China, but being part of the People's Republic of China? You think is this is compatible or, or not? I don't want to bring you, have you make some political statements, but from a legal point of view, how do you think this kind of, uh, this uh, relationship between Hong Kong that has been under British rule for one century and then has moved back to, um, to mainland China, how do you think it could be solved from a legal point of view? Um. Because obviously, like under the British rule, it would be common law, um, and um, there's that difference, like common law and Chinese civil law, and also the Chinese um, legal system, as in in the jurisdiction perspective, it's still not as advanced compared to Western country. Meaning, like there's still like death sentence or like um, like even the jury, there's no like a legitimate jury, and so I think the best way would be for the China to develop um, and catch on um, but like the only possible way um, like for Hong Kong to be um, okay with it is like the conversion of the system but not the progression of the, the system I don't know if that makes sense so not you rather think that it would be better that if you export the, the Hong Kong model to the rest of China rather than vice versa, that China exports its model to Hong Kong? In the current stage, yes. But um, it could be possible if uh, China's civil law system catch up with the other civil law system in the rest of the world, then at that stage it is possible for Hong Kong to like blend in. But until that like civilized stage, I don't think anyone in Hong Kong would be okay with that. Okay, now this is very very important just to show you that we have this we have this been discussing this issue of uh, of centralism and federalism mostly in a Western uh, in a Western perspective, and here we find a rather different situation because we have Hong Kong that was a British colony with a rather strange status because it was a colony. It was uh, 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 so it was uh, uh, it wasn't it wasn't at all independent. Independent. There was a governor uh, was who was designated by the British government uh, in Hong Kong, and here we have the, the problem of how do you introduce uh, decentralization in uh, uh, non-Western systems. Uh, in this case. Uh, People's Republic of China. Now I see, uh, sorry, uh, Hamilton, are you, can you hear us, Hamilton? Hamilton, no, Hamilton does not, does not hear us. Because um, now I see that both uh, Chloe Anzalone and Fiona Locascio are two students from Liege, Belgium, are online. I want to ask you, how do you, what is your opinion on the relationship of, of Belgium? Belgium, is it uh, somehow a divided country or is it uh, with two really, there are two parts of the country, is it the sort of federation of the uh, Flemish speaking 
Belgians and the French-speaking Belgians, or is it still a unitary nation? Just to give us an idea to the class of the various forms of centralism and federalism. Can I ask Anzalone Locascio to intervene? No, I don't manage to get them. Oh. Anzalone. Oh. I don't manage. I wanted I wanted to get the, the points of view of our two Belgian students, and they have significant problems. Just to point out that when we're talking about local autonomies, it's not there are very significant constitutional issues. And I wanted to have also the opinion of Hamilton, who studies in Edinburgh, Scotland, but comes from Northern Ireland, and therefore has, uh, uh, we see that there are very, very difficult issues. Does anybody else want to intervene on this issue of, uh, of, um, of uh, powers of, to the European Union? Uh, may I? Oh, Can sorry. you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Um... I believe, um, I mean, Europe right now is still not a federation as it lacks some parts, some elements of federations, like a democratic legitimacy of all of its institutions. And, uh, but I believe that in the European Union right now, if there were, if it uh, had to evolve in a, um, in a sort of uh, federation, I believe it would risk being highly unstable, as there are many, many different point of views, many different, even if we see uh, inside the uh, European Union right now, many kinds of governments and many kinds of, uh, many different opinions. And uh, so I believe it would risk being highly, a uh, highly unstable federation. Hmm. Okay, this is Kocha's point of view. Uh, so we should somehow um, sort of uh, the, the suggestion I seem seems to be that of let's be cautious, uh, cautious, and and have this this if we want a federation, it must be felt by by we the people of the we the people of the of Europe. Now, any other comments by the class? You seem to be. Uh, can I? Yes, Adima, uh, Adimari, yes. Yes. Uh, you are in the face of Yes. <laughs> um, oh, I don't geolocalize you. I'm controlling you. I will see who's there, and so I know Adimari is in face of uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Adimari. Yeah. I would also like to point out uh, the compensation of uh, position, uh, which sometimes uh, takes to think that. Uh, there are countries of uh, series A and uh, series B. The ceded uh, sovereignty of uh, first class and second class in English. It's yes, first class yes, second. yes. The the ceded uh, uh, sovereignty of uh, a country like Italy is not the same that Germany and France have ceded. For example, in uh, the matter of uh, immigration, Italy is evilly penalized and controlled when we know that there are countries that refuse redistribution, that beat uh, immigrants, that make them uh, live in uh, a human accommodation. When we guarantee everyone a home and food, this uh, and the other emergencies evidently show that critical issues, there are uh, certain, um, that when there, there are these critical uh, issues, there are certain countries that pretended to be a non-European countries and the others that cannot. Okay, this is clear, Dimari, so the problem, but, but is this, I mean, uh, you've made the case of immigration, and which is a very, uh, very heated, hot topic, uh, but uh, maybe it is not the only issue in which there are contentions. I mean, uh, we Italians, we feel that we are at a, not considered as German and French, but think of a small country like uh, Latvia or uh, Malta, 
Uh, so, I mean, there are countries which are much more than Italy. Uh, Sorry, there's someone who's... Uh, okay, is there anybody else? Sorry, Adimari, just let, I want to see, there's not, we don't have much time left. So I just want to see if there's someone else who wants to uh, enter the discussion on the role of the, of the European... Can you hear me? Alvatici, yes. Keep in mind what kid and what our British students said. So this is, I think, is important uh, because it is a perspective that has come true. It's not only that there was this idea, it, it, has, it is a legal, legally binding by now. Go ahead, Salvatici. Uh, I think that when we talk about what, um, like how Europe works and its institutions, we should remember that Europe is uh, a work in progress. Uh, Europe was not founded with the exact ideas uh, to get where we are now. Europe was an uh, economic community, and then it started to be so much more. So when we talk about uh, a possible federal state, um, we are not talking about the institutions we have now with a federal state. We're talking about an evolution that would uh, uh, regard all the institutions that we, had, we have now, and that would be so much different from what we know and what we have right now. So uh, Europe is gonna change in the next years because it, it, it's constantly changing since its beginning. And we don't know in what, uh, how it's gonna change, but um, it might evolve into a federal state, but as my colleague previously said, Kocha, uh, we need uh, uh, different elements to combine uh, to, um, to secure that it's going to be a safe federal state, a stable federal state. Okay, this is Salvatic's point of view. Other points of view here? No. No. No other comments? Now listen, I don't want to... I'll, um, uh, I just want just to close up the, today's lesson. I will be sending you over tomorrow, Friday, I will be sending you the, the slides, so you have the slides. I will be, um, also next week, we will go on and we will analyze the, the uh, notion of government, what we mean by government, substantial administration, which is a very important feature in distinguishing and comparing legal systems. And maybe also next week, we can, <coughs> we can start, uh, we can return discussing certain, um, uh, certain legal aspects of the coronavirus um, um, crisis. Particularly, I think uh, there are two topics I would like to uh, bring to discussion. First point, uh, can Parliament, uh, should Parliament use uh, electronic means of discussion just as we have? We have video lessons and so we have uh, video debates uh, in par uh, of Parliament and that therefore members of Parliament should be uh, not have to come to Rome and should be able to participate and, and vote it at a distance. And this is a very important aspect because it's, it's, this crisis is bringing up a whole lot of very complex and new problems which we had discussed theoretically but we had never really Based from a practical point of view, and that is one point. And the second point I want to uh, make to you, which we will analyze, we must try to analyze, in uh, two countries which are hit by the uh, coronavirus um, uh, epidemic, uh, South Korea and Israel, the, mm, the control of the citizens is done through uh, controlling their, their mobile phones. Very simply, you see uh, when you stay at home, and I know exactly that you are at home because I'm, I'm controlling you through your mobile phone. And if you start moving, I say, I immediately send a message and say, hey, you are no longer in your house, you've moved. Why are you going? Justify your movement. So it is a very, very strong technological and digital control of the citizens. I would like to discuss these two topics next week because I think these are issues that are very important for us as citizens and for you as students to try to analyze also these topics. 
so uh, just just to give you a, an idea of what we can discuss, we will be discussing next week. For the moment, uh, it's all uh, for now, and have a good uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and uh, for the rest of the lessons of the week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.